Bill, General Atlantic is in the growth equity business. And I think it's fair to say people have a good sense of what venture capital is. They've probably developed a pretty good sense of what private equity is. What's growth equity? Thanks, Eric. Um, growth equity sits between venture capital and buyouts. And while venture capital focuses on early revenue or pre-revenue stage companies, and buyouts focus on mature businesses probably in, the, let's say, the 5 to 10% growth range, uh, growth equity is, is investing in revenue stage companies that are really at the steepest, steepest part of their growth curve. So we'll get involved with a business, let's say, between 20 and $50 million of revenue, probably growing 25% or greater, and really is in need of, of traditional equity financing, not debt. And our returns are driven by company growth and market growth as opposed to operational improvement and, and apply, applying leverage. Much has been made of the shift of capital out of public markets into private markets. Growth equity has really been sort of at the sweet spot there, hasn't it? It's been a big part of the growth in private markets versus public markets. And let me just comment on a few things. I mean, first, over the last several decades, we've had private market assets grow to $3.5 trillion plus $2 trillion of dry powder that's available for investment in private From what? companies. From probably sub, well, sub a trillion for, you know, over the last decade. These are some of the things that Leon Black was talking about. Yeah, Le Leon was, was, was dead right. This has been a significant development in the overall global capital market. And if you, if you think about another uh, incredible transition in the last two decades is the, a doubling of the number of private equity-backed companies and a halving of the number of public companies. So the shift of value from public to private has been very significant. Now, it's, it's increased our opportunity set, which is great. Uh, but it also means that companies that would have gone public, let's say, between a $500 million and a $2 million market cap are waiting till much, much further in their development before they now, go public. Now, that delay is a source of tension. And this tension between the role of the private market and the role of the public market has been simmering for some years already. But Uber's IPO feels like a watershed moment. Is the lesson in Uber's IPO, no matter how you think about it, that growth companies, if they want to go public, need to go public sooner than that? Well, I think the lesson is, or what, what's happening, is that more of the growth of these companies is happening in the private market than in the public market. So Uber, if you step back from it and talk about a $60 billion plus valuation, what an incredible accomplishment. But so much of that happened in the private market. If we go back to the days of Microsoft going public in the mid-80s, 99% of their value creation happened as a public company, not as a private company. And so that's a big shift. I think it's a reason why many institutional investors and even retail investors have said, I've got to get exposure to private markets if I want to participate in the most interesting innovations and, in, and with the most innovating entrepreneurs. So General Atlantic was an Uber investor dating back to 2015. Yep. And you enjoyed some of that appreciation yep. while the company was private. Do you look at the IPO and call it a disappointment? I don't. I, I talk about it as a milestone in the company's development. They still have to work their way into their business model towards profitability. I think they, they talked a lot about that on their earnings call. Uh, so I don't see it as the end of the road. I see it as an important milestone. Uh, I think it was a, an achievement in terms of uh, making that company available to public investors, but I, but I think it's got a, lo a long way to go. If you could re-edit the Uber movie thus far, how, how, how would it look different? Um, the only thing I would have probably done differently is maybe push the governance transition and the move to a, a professional CEO like Dara a little bit earlier. I think some of, the, some of the challenges that they're dealing with today, or they've dealt with over the last year, would have been dealt with a year or two earlier. But beyond that, I think they've done a great job. So you raise an interesting point about an IPO for a company like Uber being a milestone. Um, but at the same time, we've acknowledged that, at least under the current construct, so much more value, if you will, is created while the company is private. What future does that leave? for the public market. I mean, it raises some existential questions about the purpose of the public market and why anybody would want to participate there. And if you had a choice, why you'd want to be in the public market when you could be in the private market. Yeah. 
I, I mean, if we go back, when I started in the business about you know, over 25 years ago, the public market was a critical source of capital for company development because the venture capital market was quite small, the growth equity market was even smaller, and the buyout business was just getting, was just getting going. And so capital formation had to happen in the public markets if you wanted to fuel your, grow, fuel your growth into the future. Now, as we talked about earlier, it's happening, capital is widely available in the private markets. And what CEOs are realizing is that they can accomplish a lot more as a private company and, and forestall the distraction of quarterly earnings, meeting with investors, that 10 to 20% of management time that gets, gets taken away to manage, the public, to manage being a public company. So that's, that's a shift, and I think that there's some positives to it, there's negatives. The, the biggest negatives for me is that public investors not having access to some of the most exciting companies early in their development as they, as they did 20 years ago. There used to be something of a halo effect around going public and being public. The way you describe it, having to meet with investors, the regulatory burden, um, is, is the halo effect gone? Well, I think the halo effect has just moved again to the private markets. I mean, you know, becoming a but unit. But that's a huge shift. It's, it, it's, you know, more, I mean, let's not forget, at one point, yeah. while it was still private, people were valuing, or at least pinning a value on Uber, north of $100 billion. Yeah. Well, you know, some of this whole discussion about unicorns, or we, we call super winners, you know, that's happening in the private market now. I mean, that's, that's as much an announcement of a company's success as it used to be when a company went public. So if, again, using Uber as an example, um, if so much of that can happen in private, and, and what we've seen thus far, at least with Uber as the example, happens in public, what's the implication for other portfolio companies, of yours and others, and I'll point to Airbnb as an example? Yeah. Well, there, there, there's, there's been a lot of success of, of companies going public, even this year. I mean, the, the Zoom IPO was, 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 was terrific, and Pinterest as well. And I think there's a number of exciting ones, some in our portfolio, CrowdStrike, Slack, uh, down the road, Airbnb, all coming. And I think both in the B2B and the B2C market. And I think we're, we're going to have some big successes of companies going public and still generating attractive returns for investors. All these companies still have lots of runway for growth. They're serving very, very large markets. And I think, again, they'll still be able to generate attractive returns, maybe even more so than the rideshare business. That's a fair point. But structurally, mm -hmm. if you acknowledge that there's an enormous amount of money in post-venture capital private mm -hmm. equity financing, and of course there's private equity as well, is it increasingly possible that the life cycle, the capital life cycle of the corporate entity is going to change. In other words, it isn't going to go from venture capital to growth equity to IPO. It might go from venture capital to growth equity to private equity to permanent capital vehicle. Let's talk about that, because I think you're on to something there, Eric. I, I, I think the stages are different now. Venture capital has grown over 400% in the last decade, so there's more companies are venture-backed from the beginning. Then growth equity, like General Atlantic, steps in. We're active investors, we're company builders, we're deeply involved in the business. Then you're having a stage where I would say non-traditional, more passive investors, you know, they can include sovereign wealth funds and others, are coming in pre-IPO, but also with very scale capital, making commitments of $200 million to $2 billion in that stage, again, pre-IPOs, so you're absolutely right. And, and in, in that category would be some of these new long-term funds that we've seen raised. And again, that's gonna probably create another two to five years of runway for a company as a, private, as a private business. And then finally, it's going to the public market, but it's not going at a, a value of two billion or three billion or four billion. It's going at a value of 20 to 30 to $40 billion plus. So it, it's, it's, it just changed the life cycle of, of investing, especially in growth sectors like technology. Given the tsunami of money that is flowing into private markets, do you see anything that could rewind the clock, if you will, and restore the appeal of the public market as a venue where you want to raise capital while you're still in the growth phase of your company? Well, Rapid growth phase, because clearly they continue to grow once they're public. Yeah. I, I think the real story of, of private equity and growth equity over the last decade or decade plus has been is generated, attract, generated attractive returns 
I mean, 300 basis points plus on average over the public markets. And my view is that as long as it continues to generate those kinds of returns, Money's gonna capital keep is going to come in, and you're going to and this this elongation of p private company status, status is going to continue. Now, again, drawing a distinction between venture capital and growth equity, a lot of people think of venture capital as the place where all the great ideas are born or at least financed, and I suppose that's true. But I think of growth equity as a better barometer for the future because venture capital can afford to get a lot of things wrong, right? You get one moonshot and all of a sudden, you know, you, you've made your fund. Um, you guys can't afford to make nearly as many mistakes. So I would like to know, what do you think? What is General Atlantic betting on as the trends or forces or technologies that you believe mm. are most disruptive and perhaps as a corollary to that will create the most value? Sure. Let, let, Eric, let me just talk about two big thematic drivers for our investment program and then go a level deeper in some of them. The, the first is, you know, we have a, a, a very strongly held view that we are in the midst of a transition to a digital economy on a global basis. We all know that, we talk about it every day, but we think that is a long-term secular trend that we want to be invested behind. The, sec the second one is, is growth being driven by emerging markets. 60% of our investing activity is outside the U.S., about 35% in emerging markets. But if you look at the global economy today, over 60% is EM, and 70, 80% of global economic growth is coming from emerging markets. So we feel like we've got to be leveraged against India, China, Southeast Asia, Latin American growth. So that's the other big one. But I would say more- a Geographic a, shift. It's, it's, it, it's a massive shift of economic growth. And, if, and it, it, a lot of it's going to happen in this decade. It, between now and 2030, uh, the, the two biggest economies in the world become China and India, the fourth biggest Indonesia. Uh, the U.S. is third, and Germany and Japan fall to number nine and ten. So very, very big shifts in the complexion of the global economy. We've got to be exposed to the places where that growth is happening as a growth equity investor. The, the second thing I would say is we're at a very interesting and exciting shift, I think, in technology. Um, we, technology over the last decade and the opportunity set has been driven by the growth of the mobile Internet, so, social media, et cetera. That's really driven, you know, this, this growth from a very small number of basically smartphones to now we've got four billion smartphones in the world. We're nearing the end of that cycle. Oh, I'd throw cloud computing in there as well. Not that they're going to go away, but the, but the fundamental growth is, is largely behind us. But I think- So what replaces that? AI, machine learning, and data. We are absolutely moving in the era of data. All the, many of the application software companies we see now are really AI driven. They're using the, the tenets of machine learning and AI. They're capitalizing the fact that there's an explosion of data that's being created from everything from the Internet of Things on one end to point of sale systems, mobile Internet, et cetera. Fueling data, that's the raw material for AI and machine learning. So that's where the innovation is shifting to. And, and, that, and that's where we've, we're spending quite a bit of time in those areas. General Atlantic, by my count, has at least 15 investments in China. Yes. And the businesses range from rental apartment management to cloud-based music streaming, early childhood education. Um, is GA taking a more cautious approach to investing in China, given the current tensions? Well, we've, we've been rewarded by staying bullish on China since we started investing there in the year 2000. We've got about over $2 billion of value in China today in those 15, $2 billion. $2 billion in those 15 companies. But I just just a, a moment. You know, we, we focus on technology, mm -hmm. financial services, healthcare, and the consumer, all segments that really are part of the private economy in China, not the state-owned or state-based part of the economy. And and that's been driven by entrepreneurship and fundamental growth. We we think that growth is going to continue even with uh, trade tensions continuing. Virtually none of our companies are really exposed to ex the export economy or these tariffs. So we remain positive. Now, having said that, I think this, this is, we're, we're, we're seeing a fundamental shift, and David talked about it a moment ago, in the relationship between the U.S. and China. This is more than just a trade dispute. So but do you hit the pause button as a result? Well, we, uh, we, we've, we've raised our bar in terms of you know, the, the kind of returns we expect and where, where we want to enter on valuation to compensate us for what we think is potentially a riskier environment. And the fact that you know, I think when you put all the, connect all the dots around trade tensions, potentially a technology cold war between the two countries, you know, economic growth can be impacted. It may not be as fast growth as we've seen. The story. It was already slowing down in China, but we may see a bit more. So you need more of what 
Buffett would call a margin of safety. Margin of safety, and we're being just. We had an investment committee with our China team yesterday, and and they were they were hitting the pause button and just saying, you know, we want to see a little bit more cushion on valuation. We want to see private markets adjust a bit more uh, to the, to reflect the reality of of this realignment. Private markets tend to adjust more slowly than public markets to new information, so I, I think we'll, 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 we're watching it pretty carefully. And that return premium that you describe that you need to see now is, is how many more points? Um, the way we think about it is, is more valuation. Uh, you know, I think we, we want to see valuations come down a bit. And, um, you know, this was over the last 36 months, values in China have been, have been uh, I won't say elevated, but they've been full and they've, been, they've reflected very, very strong growth prospects in the private economy. I think we want to see a little bit more cushion in valuation. Right now, the concerns for U.S. companies are mainly around supply chains and the ability to which they'll be able to export mm -hmm. technology mm -hmm. or at least sell technology. How much of a risk do you see of battle lines being redrawn um, in financial terms? In other words, where there are restrictions placed on capital flows, um, and, and maybe even on, on access to financial markets, such mm -hmm. that the $2 billion that you've got invested in China might become trapped there? It's a great question, so let, let, let's go into it for a minute. I, it, let's start with the commercial side and come back to financial, the financial sector. I mean, what, the way we've been thinking about it is the last 30 years uh, have been characterized by deep economic integration on the demand and supply side mm -hmm. between China and the U.S., we may be at, a, at a, a juncture or a reset where we're beginning to disintegrate the demand chains and supply chains that exist, which has got a whole series of implications. Um, we don't believe that one of China's reaction will be, will be to cut off capital flow. Uh, that has been very robust over the last several years. We think that will continue, particularly in the private sector, but it is a risk. I mean, all of us use a very complicated VIE structure to invest in China that allows for companies to go public in Hong Kong and the US. So interestingly, most of us who are exposing capital to China are actually exiting in non-Chinese capital markets in the Hong Kong market and the US market. We've, we've seen that happen over the years. The, it, almost 20% of the IPOs in the last few years have been actually Chinese companies listing in the US. But this is a standoff that has turned into a, a retaliatory tit for tat. What if? And it's not a crazy suggestion. Uh, the Trump administration were to cut China's access off to Wall Street. I mean, it'd be, it, it would have severe implications. But I think this, you know, if, we, if we look at two seminal things on, on, the, on the demand chain, or, or, or the integration of the economies, Huawei, I think, is seminal. I think Alibaba relisting in Hong Kong is seminal. I think the fact that, you know, I, I do not think we will see a major Chinese company go public in the U.S for the foreseeable future, I think they'll be going public in Hong Kong. You all know that. I take it you don't either. I don't believe it will. I, I think what will happen is that the Hong Kong exchange changed their rules to be much more flexible in terms of money losing companies, including biotech, which is an important sector for them. So I think you're gonna see the government in China strongly encourage Chinese companies, even domiciled offshore through the VIA structure, to go public in Hong Kong, cl closer to home. More, more under the control of the Chinese government, although the, to, to a degree independent, but, but very accessible to global investors. What I don't think they want to do is cut off access by global investors to their most exciting parts of their economy. Bill, you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Eric. Great to be Ladies here. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank Bill you. Ford. Thanks.